Welcome, Gavin. Gavin's the Executive Director of the Investment Division, Department of Employment, Small Business and Training. And Checkup does have programs funded through DESBIT, as we, as we abbreviate it to. Um, so thanks, Gavin, for coming along today and giving us an update on the work being undertaken by DESBIT. Over to you. Thank you, David, and thanks for the opportunity to come along. Um, I've pulled together a quick little uh, presentation on some of the key stats around training and skills investment in the health industry. So I focused on health industry qualifications and skill sets. So under the HLT training package nationally. Um, so there's about four slides on a few stats just to pull out a couple of trends and then some discussion points before opening up into questions. So I'll try to keep on time. Um, excuse the stock photos. I was, I was advised that the, um, the standard engineering ones I had on my um, slides may not be as appropriate. So um, we whipped them out of a previous document. So I might go on to slide two. So at a high level, um, our investment in health industry qualifications remains quite strong and growing as reflected by the growing um, labour market um, status for health, health industry occupations. Obviously the vocational education and training sector only services a proportion of occupations um, in health um, with a lot of them obviously serviced by the university sector. Um, in terms of VET, vocational education and training, um, we're seeing um, health going up our rankings in terms of total investment. Um, and it's grown quite strongly in the last full financial year by about 20% in terms of funding and about 30% in terms of students. Um, so as you can see from that slide, almost 19,000 students um, were supported through subsidised training in Queensland through um, health qualifications. Um, the, the priority qualifications, we do subsidise quite a broad range of qualifications in health. Um, there's about 27 um, HLT training pathways. Like a lot of industry areas, um, it is concentrated on a relatively small number. So about 85% of funding and 75% of students are in the top five pathways. And I'll, I'll show you which ones those are a bit later on. And similarly, it's quite an active training market. So. We do have overall about 408, I think it is, Skills Assure Supplies, so approved training providers who access um, subsidised training in Queensland on behalf of eligible students. 45 um, are, are active in HLT qualifications um, last financial year. Um, and again, 85% um, of that funding is through the top five um, Skills Assure Supplies. So two public, so that's TAFE Queensland and Central Queensland University two large privates and one community um, and enterprise RTO. Um, so I might go to the next slide, just to give you a profile of, it's a bit dense, so I'll, I'll skip to the highlights um, of what the five qualifications are. Um, there is a strong growing pre-employment um, or entry lower entry level qualification in the Cert 2 in health support services. Um, it's our second highest volume um, health qualification. Um, has the most students, but second highest in terms of investment. So about 6,000 students uh, went through that qualification in 2021. Um, it is the majority of those um, are through a vet in schools pathway. Um, so through um, health hubs um, and, and those types of regional networks um, that support students, hopefully to get access to work experience and hopefully post-school pathways, but to give them an interest in health Obviously, the aim of Vet in Schools isn't just to provide post-school employment. It can be to interest students in um, maintaining health-related qualifications while at school, but also um, progressing through to university pathways. Um, similar to overall, while there were 16 active um, approved providers in that qualification, four of those deliver to about 80% of students. Um, and then... Um, at entry level, there were three, certificate three qualifications, health services assistance, pathology collection, and dental assisting. And they had generally between 450 and 1,000 students going through um, in a year um, and funding of over a million dollars, about a million to a million and a half um, investment. Some are available, but all three of those are available as traineeship pathways, but only dental assisting um, has a strong traineeship um, pathway. Um, and there's relatively low levels of skills assure supplies in that space, um, between five and eight for each of those qualifications. Um, and then the final one is obviously the, the largest in terms of investment and almost the largest in terms of students. 
um, which is the Diploma of Nursing for Enrolled, enrolled Nursing Occupation. Um, it's delivered through three uh, providers, TAFE Queensland, CQU and one other. Um, and it also has linkages to the VET Student Loans Program um, for gap fees for students. Um, so it is a significant um, VET pathway and, and has been for, for many years. And it um, certainly is a significant um, area of activity for TAFE Queensland as our largest public provider, um, with a lot of um, training infrastructure being invested in that, in that health space. So I might move on to the next one, um, so we can quickly go through these slides. Um, just to give you an idea of diversity of student uh, profile in health and comparison overall. Um, so uh, given the ref reference to, to RAPS earlier on and closing the gap, um, health generally is quite strong for Indigenous participation. 8.3% um, of our students um, uh, were um, Aboriginal or, or Torres Strait Islanders. Um, that's only 4.4% in nursing. So obviously there's a gap there that um, could be targeted. Um, and that compares overall for our student um, participation of about 7.7% for Indigenous students. So um, health is um, an attractive um, pathway for Indigenous students and um, compared to overall VET participation, it is, it is a strong, strong area for Indigenous participation. Um, students with a disability um, is more on par, still lower participation in nursing um, as a diploma qualification. Um, and student numbers are, are, are continuing to increase um, in that category. Um, culturally and linguistic, linguistically diverse, um, or probably more accurately, non-English speaking background within the VET sector um, is again, um, on, almost on par with overall participation um, and, and almost on par for nursing. So that's probably the one where um, overall participation is, is reflected in the nursing pathway. Um, and female students, um, reflective of the, the um, the industry workforce um, participation, it is a very, very strong area for um, female participation from the students and, and obviously outstrips um, the VET sector overall, uh, where we tend to have um, lower participation of female students in some of the traditional trade areas. Um, so I might go on to the next. Just to give you an idea of regional um, participation, um, the nursing is probably the one that's a little bit out of sync with overall um, regional participation um, in, in um, health and overall for vet students, um, where it is it does tend to be centred around southeast Queensland and coastal centres rather than getting a much more even um, distribution of students around the state, and that's partially to do with um, the the delivery models that that are used in nursing and the challenges relating to online learning, which often supports um, broader regional and remote participation. Um, but we do see strong participation across regions at certificate two and certificate three level, um, where um, health overall um, has a lot of commonalities with overall VET, with probably the exception of the ones I highlighted there, central Queensland's lower than overall participation. So that's something um, that we could certainly look into. And the same with Darling Downs is lower. Uh, and that could have something to do with um, nursing participation in terms of student numbers as well. Um, and the final slide um, is just an idea of, um, for, for in terms of state activity, is some of the areas that data jumps out at us in terms of opportunities. So um, there's certainly a, a clear gap between overall VET participation and what happens in health around employment-based training, so um, traineeships. Um, they only the, the trainees only comprise 2% of health students, um, whereas overall, um, they comprise about 40% of our investment and 40% of our students um, across all industries. And obviously, there's a, a wide range of variants um, across industry sectors where um, in trade-based industries like construction, engineering, um, utilities, et cetera, there is a high proportion of um, apprentices um, make up the student cohort. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you get industries where traineeships are not um, in common practice. But certainly we would identify that, whether that be school-based traineeships or mainstream trainees, as an area where employers could um, target trying to grow their own um, skilled employees rather than taking graduates from um, institutional programs. Um, diversity, there was certainly some um, 
areas where the profile of students was different to health overall or um, vet overall. Um, and that's certainly in terms of nursing regional delivery and nursing in terms of student diversity. Um, so that's certainly a discussion we can begin to have with TAFE as the major provider in that area. And also um, slightly lower participation areas in um, disability and, and culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, and then across all industries, um, opportunities for partnerships that certainly we see that the more employers are involved in the training arrangements, the better the outcomes for students and industry are. Um, so there's certainly opportunities to improve um, our vet in schools investment, which is in significant in health, um, as well as overall um, investment in terms of work placements and partnerships between employers and RTOs to source graduates. Um, and certainly there's opportunities, um, as with all vet programs around um, electives. Uh, so the packaging rules and training packages do allow flexibility in how qualifications are put together. And the more employers evolve, the more they can customise um, the outcome for students to match their um, specific requirements and also begin to contextualise content within um, the environment that they work. So they were just a number of um, just, I suppose, areas for consideration and, 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 and ones that we focus on uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, and then my final slide um, is really just a, an overview of the, the current national reform landscape, which, as it always seems to be for VET, um, is significant and ongoing. So um, many of you may be linked in with the Commonwealth's um, skills reform um, advice and stakeholder, fit, uh, stakeholder consultation processes, but there are a number of significant reform um, um, topics um, underway at the moment. There are immediate ones around industry engagement and certainly the health um, skills service organisation is at the centre of some of those pilots and potential new models. Um, quality reforms and qualification reforms around the training packages. And certainly there are ongoing discussions going on with governments and stakeholders around vet for school students, foundation skills, apprenticeships and micro-credentials. There's also pricing reform underway through the National Skills um, Commission. Um, and then there's um, a commitment to those reforms reflected in the, the heads of agreement for skills reform. Um, so they were, um, to try and keep on, keep on time, they were the, the, the key points um, I, was, I was happy to raise. I'm happy for this presentation to be shared, shared with the group. Um, and I think the final slide just has my contact details for anyone who wishes um, to um, raise any questions. Um, as I'm on my phone, I can't really tell if anyone had any questions lodged, uh, but that's the end of the presentation for me. Thanks, David. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, in fact, we do have a question, so I'll just uh, read that out to you. Um, it's from Ian Ludwig, who I believe is based in Cairns. Uh, and Ian asks, of the 2% of uh, H HLT trainees, would you know how many were attached or employed within an Aboriginal medical service? Uh, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't have that data off the top of my head. It's probably a question we can take offline and provide further advice. Okay. So, Ian, we'll, um, we'll commit to um, investigating that for you and seeing if, if that data is, in fact, available. Okay, there aren't any further questions in there, Gavin. So I just encourage anyone to type a question, as I say, at any time. And just to point out that, yes, slides will be made available um, if the speaker is, is able to. Um, and this is also being recorded as well. So if you've got colleagues who perhaps couldn't make it today, uh, we'll send you the link and then you can um, pass that on. All right, so thanks again, Gavin. Um, we'll move on now to our next presentation. I'm not exactly sure who it's going to be, but let's try um, uh, Tammy Dennis from the Australian Government Department of Education, Skills and Employment. Tammy, can we have hear we, you now? Yeah, have we fixed the technical issue? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. That's fantastic. Oh, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> we did have um, we did have Haleen Grogan down, but she said she'd be arriving just around 10.30, so she had to come from another meeting. So if it's okay, we'll, we'll jump straight to your presentation Absolutely. and then Absolutely. we'll hear from Haleen following that. And just to introduce um, Tammy, Tammy works in industry engagement, the National Health and Care Portfolio for the Australian Government Department of 
education, skills, and employment. Not sure if I got that right before, but um, it, also known as DES. So it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> So um, over to you, Tammy. Thanks for coming along today. Thank you. And I thought I'd just paint a little bit of a picture um, as to why I'm here. So I am part of the Employer Liaison Network within the Industry Engagement Team with DESI. Um, our team recently undertook a restructure and rather than a place-based model that we had. So some of you may have worked with Vicky Wybird or Sandy Harris before. We've now moved to a national industry focus and I look after health and care. Um, over the past six months, I've been working very closely with Vicky at Checkup to look at workforce planning, identified needs and barriers uh, within my, my portfolio and how we can collaborate with stakeholders in this space and to address some of the industry challenges, challenges and needs. I'm also based in the Northern Territory and have worked on a lot of Indigenous pro employment programs. So I am also within our team, the point of contact for any pre-employment programs that we have for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander job seekers on our caseload. So if we could just go to the next slide. Um, today's presentation is uh, a bit longer than some of the others that we've already heard from this morning. So I do apologise in advance. We have got 18 slides to get through, but I'll try and keep my talking notes as brief as I possibly can. We will go through these key nine points that we've got here on the overview. And as I said, there's a lot of information, so please bear with me and I'm more than happy to send through any fact sheets on any of the programs or um, topics that we covered today and also send a copy of the slides um, after today's session. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so employee liaison officers, there's a real demand for health and care support services as they continue to grow. Employers are facing increasing challenges in attracting and training and retaining sufficiently skilled workforce, but also in the labour workforce as well. To meet demand in the highly competitive market with health care and support, business, support, businesses do require access to a national pipeline of job seekers, particularly young people who are ready to begin their career. As part of my role, my main focus is to work with peak bodies in, and employers within the sector, including both home and residential care services, to help them fill their significant labour demands, as well as reviewing skill shortages to support long-term growth within the sector. We build industry and business relationships at a national level. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, all good. Uh, Okay, um, to understand what the employment needs and skill requirements are to co-design future workforce solutions. Support to employers does identify opportunities to improve retention of employers, employees and share industry knowledge and insights. My presentation today will provide a snapshot of relevant employment and skills programs and initiatives that are de delivered by our department, um, which employers and service providers can leverage and reference, informing their recommendations or solutions to health and the care industries. Um, we do work with relevant stakeholders to collaborate on projects to meet the needs of industry and some of that does include pre-employment. So if we can go to the next slide. So as one of our, uh, I guess, biggest stakeholders in this is our employment and recruitment service providers. Um, currently we have Job Active, Transition to Work and Parents Next, and these providers pre-screen candidates match to the employer's requirements, facilitate work experience before employees, uh, um, before they actually employ a candidate, organise wage subsidies, support the candidate and provide funding to support job seekers through um, their training and other requirements through the employment fund. They do help you find the right staff to address workforce needs but however we have got a change coming from the 1st of July 2022 which is Workforce Australia. It'll be supported with a new platform to help employers um, from the right candidates with the right, find the right candidates with the right skills. We've undertaken extensive consultation to ensure the best application for Workforce Australia modelling um, is there to meet your needs. Further information will be coming in the following months. I can't really speak more to that at the moment. And we'll go to wage subsidies. So wage subsidies criteria does apply. You need to be zero to 12 months on unemployed employment benefits. And I can send you a fact sheet with a bit more information regarding this. Wage subsidies are a financial incentive which provides 
uh, providers can decide to employers to offer employers to encourage them to hire eligible participants in ongoing jobs by contributing to the initial cost of hiring new a uh, new employee. Wage subsidies can help to build a business and give employers greater flexibility in their hiring options. Some people get a little bit confused about the term wage subsidies. They're thinking that it needs to go through the actual wage of an employee. Um, but what we have found is organisations that take on a number of employees do use that subsidised funding to go to other services. So it might be to um, be used to put towards mentoring of a group of candidates that you've recently employed. It could be for additional training or other purposes. It doesn't necessarily have to go towards a wage. It's just referenced that way. Um, Long-term unemployment are people that have um, been on income support for at, you know, a period of 12 months or more and are looking at either changing career options or um, you know, moving on to or outside of reliance of income support. So it can be a potential supported pathway to get off income support benefits. Um, I won't go into any more detail about wage subsidies, but I am happy to put some inf information through in a summary at the end of all of this for you. I'm conscious of trying to keep these slides minimal. Um, incentive to hire trainees. So some of you will be aware of um, the boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, which is a maximum of $7,000 per quarter. Under the CAC, eligible employers will receive a 10% wage subsidy in the second year of an eligible apprenticeship, up to a maximum of $1,500. And this is all facilitated through our skills area of the department. And again, more information can come through. So we'll move on to the next slide. And this will be a quick slide because it's just introducing what some of our pre-employment programs and resources are within the department. And so first of all, we have Launch Into Work. Um, if we could go to the next slide, that would be awesome. Thank you. The Launch Into Work program supports employers to deliver pre-employment projects, including training, work experience and mentoring that prepare job seekers for specific vacancies in their organisation. Job seekers are selected for project-based work on their potential to meet the requirements of identified positions, the values and attributes that they can demonstrate. All participants who successfully complete projects off, are offered employment, so there's guaranteed employment at the end attached to this pre-employment program, which is always a benefit to keep the momentum flowing. While the program is primarily, primarily focused on creating long-term employment pathways for women, men can also participate. Projects can be conducted in a variety of industries and the program is suitable for employers willing to use a pre-employment project as a way of recruiting for positions that offer career pathways to job seekers. If you haven't developed a project focus on, new skill, on skilling new staff before and you are looking to hire them, this funding will help you build and manage a project. The department will work with you to design the project around your needs and leverage funding on your behalf, as well as assist with marketing to potential candidates. This program has actually had an extension of funding where there's um, quite a significant investment to take us over the next five years. So it is a really good pre-employment pathway to tap onto your short-term, long-term and mid-term um, opportunities that you have within the workforce. We also have our local jobs program with employment facilitators. Some of you may be familiar with them in your local regions. We have extended the um, coverage of employment facilitators across the country to 51 employment regions that um, were primarily introduced to assist with the recovery from COVID-19. But again, the pre-employment programs that have come from this program have proven to be very effective. So this is something that we're quite comfortable having extended and to continue to tap into as an option for industry. Employment facilitators really do um, look to meet the needs of region employers and the job seekers. So it's a, a coverage across all stakeholders. There are local task force that identify key employment priorities, local labour needs and design potential solutions. Task force compromise of local businesses, employment service providers, training providers and other key stakeholders. The task force are refreshed regularly and would welcome representation from, the, from health, care and any other industry sector. The local job plan developed identifies key employment and training priorities and provides 
a framework for driving employment outcomes in the context of the labour market locally. There is funding available that can address priorities in the local jobs plan. For example, there was a recent project that was delivered in Alice Springs called Care for, Carers, Care for Careers. The activity included a program of employer forums that were run from Crest NT in Darwin and Alice Springs. There was mentoring and support that was provided to employers that were looking at taking on job seekers. It then led to a group recruitment drive in Darwin and Alice Springs that supported job seekers into work placements. That project value was based at $63,000, around $63,000, and has proven to be quite successful. So we'll move on to work experience. You may have heard before of the National Work Experience and there's Youth Job Path youth jobs path internships. I don't know why our department gives us so many long references to spell out. Um, the benefits to the employer is there is a trial of the job seeker before undertaking the recruitment process, which can be quite a lengthy and costly process. It's also an opportunity for the job seeker to experience a workplace, particularly if they're in, entering the workforce for the first time or the industry for the first time. So it really is a try before you buy for both parties. Um, it does give the job seekers an opportunity to grow their skills and confidence and build their workplace experience. We have got a program at the moment called uh, Path Business Placement Partnerships. This slide here will give you a little bit of detail about what this program is. However, this program is finishing on the 30th of June 2022. So we've only got three months outside of um, where we are now to wrap this program up. So the, the likelihood of new projects being developed is very low. So I won't spend a significant amount of time going through this, but if you do have a project where, or, or an opportunity where you feel that there is a large uh, recruitment opportunity in terms of numbers, so you know something that might have more than 40 vacancies, I'm happy to discuss this program with you a little bit further. But it is key for, for uh, key thought for you. Um, NDS is actually one of the panel members that are associated with this program. Um, we'll move on to Job Trainer. <clears throat> so Job Trainer is a $1 billion initiative as part of the skills reform. As part of its economic response to COVID-19, the Australian government is providing free or low fee training courses through the Job Trainer Fund. Um, you heard in the presentation earlier that there are, is some training available in Queensland. It is the state government that uh, decides on which courses and qualifications are available. The funding is available for full qualifications of courses based on the list agreed between the National Skills Commission and state and territory governments. And as at December 31st, 2021, there were more than 313,000 enrolments for the job trainer funded training places. So it is um, quite beneficial to industry. It's well received by people undertaking the qualifications and something that I could definitely send more information to you on. We also have the Jobs Hub and um, Jobs Fairs. So Jobs Hub will combine current vacancies by business and industry to make it easier for those looking for employment to connect to employers. So you know, originally we had a, a lot of job seekers relying on Seek and other mainstream um, uh, portals for advertising of vacancies and vacancies that were available to them. Uh, a result of COVID-19 um, did give us an opportunity to have a look at our own internal system to see how we can connect industry to job seekers and make that match a little bit smoother. Some employers use their current career pages to advertise in employment opportunities, but you can email our team to also advertise your current jobs for free. Throughout 2021 and 2022, there will be 51 face-to-face -face jobs fairs throughout regional and metro areas. So we've got quite a few coming up. In Queensland specifically, there is one coming up for Cairns, Gold Coast, Rockhampton, um, and there's definitely more to come. Uh, that's for the jobs fairs and um, we have a dedicated, we have in the past had dedicated care fairs available for industry and it is something also that we're looking to do for the health sector. So if there is an opportunity coming up, we're more than happy to share that with Vicky at, at checkup and she can pass those details over to you. But also feel free to stay 
every now and then on our jobs fair um, or jump on our jobs fair website because the dates are always updated on there. Okay, so other useful information. The National Skills Commission is undertaking an in-depth study into the care workforce for, as a result of the care workforce inquiry on the factors that are affecting the supply and demand of workers, both in the near term and longer term to 2050. It was commissioned in March 21, and the links that are attached here in the slide provide further information and publications. I'm really conscious of time, so I won't go through a lot of detail here. We do also have the National Careers Institute, which was formed in the 2019-2020 budget measure. The role is to provide access to reliable and accurate careers information, resources and support. So for example, dedicated school leavers have an information kit as well as parents and guardian. Um, they have a guide for school leavers. The National Careers Institute, Your Careers website, has information on career pathways and training opportunities to help stream people into the health and care sector. We also have the Labour Market Information Portal that has a lot of data that um, covers employment regions, projections and vacancies reports. And the Job Outlook site is a really good uh, website that covers skills matching, career quizzes, careers in demands by location, future industries and growth and what those opportunities may look like. We have workforce specialists. Like again, this is another topic that I can't go into a lot of detail on because it is currently out for um, submission. So uh, as part of the new employment services model that I spoke to before about Workforce Australia, um, commencing in July, the Australian government is establishing a panel of workforce specialists. The workforce specialists would deliver a range of strategic projects to meet the workforce needs of identified key industries and occupations, connecting them to suitable job seekers in digital services and enhanced services. Funding of $12.5 million will be available each year to support the de delivery of projects under this initiative. So this is, um, we, I mentioned before that there was past business placement partnerships that ceases on the 30th of June. This project here will do something similar where industry will be still be able to have co-design projects um, implemented that can meet their industry need. Our workforce connections plan will identify key industries and occupations with labour market opportunities for job seekers to inform the delivery of workforce specialist projects. The department is currently in the process of developing the first workforce connections plan, which includes identifying key industries and occupations that have workforce needs that could be addressed through connection to suitable job seekers in employment services as part of the workforce specialist project, understanding what data and information may be available to support the plan and how the plan will align and complement other workforce plans, strategies currently in development or finalised. The reason we say I'm bringing this to your attention is health and care sector has been identified in the current framework, so this could be potentially um, something you may choose to work with down the future. Further information is available on Austender, and there is a recorded information presentation available on YouTube, YouTube platform, which summarises the initiative and the tender process. The closing date for the current tender is 21st of March. Uh, we also have the skills checkpoint. So from 1st of January this year, employees who are over, aged over 40 and may qualify, that's over 40 years old and may qualify for skills checkpoint. This means that they can access funding to assist professional development of staff to meet evolving business requirements. Mature age work, workers bring enormous experience and value to any organisation. And with rapidly changing technologies, professional development requirements, that may include updating skills to ensure that they match future business requirements. Skills Checkpoint can identify how additional skills can assist eligible participants to continue to add value or transition into new roles within any organisation. Employees could qualify for a training incentive under the program covering a maximum co-contribution of between 50 and 75% with the maximum amount being up to 2,200. There is further information that can be found at the National Skills Commission Skills Priority List and the website. At the moment, the organisation that is um, 
looking after skills checkpoint in Queensland is busy at work and I can definitely send you more information on the contact details for that. And for the last slide, we have the Human Services Skills Organisation Pilot and Foundation Skills for Your Future. Projects focusing on delivering skilled employees that meet the evolving demands of industry today and into the future. They were developed into entry, developed an entry into care roles skill set to provide job seekers and displaced workers with entry level skills to start working in the care support sectors. Recently, a pilot was completed and the outcome recommendation was the extension of the entry to care role skill set. The entry into care role skill set was designed to rapidly upskill people to work in entry level care and support roles in the health and care sector. The skill set includes three units of companies, competencies and mm -hmm. will provide learners with foundational knowledge and skills. Evaluation on finding is on the um, HSSO website and an independent evaluation of the skill, kit was, skill set was completed in August 2021. This found that learners who completed the skill set are broadly equipped with skills and knowledge required to support fully qualified carers within age, care, disability and health support environments. Foundation Skills Program, which is facilitated by our skills area, is helping employers with employee skill development training. It's tailored for the workplace and it supports Australians who need flexible training in reading, writing, maths, English, and any other digital skills delivered throughout the service providers. Employer workforce training, workplace training is a focus on, again, employer and industry needs. It's either accredited or non-accredited, so it can be up to a certificate two level. And then there's personalized skills training, which includes client-centered client approach, tailored accredited or non-accredited training, and flexibility to accommodation, lifestyle and learning needs. There is more information on our DESI website and there are a number of projects with a very extensive list of projects that have um, been undertaken through this initiative in Queensland. Okay, so as I've mentioned a few times through the presentation, my um, uh, we had 18 slides to get through. There was a lot of information to take on board. I am happy to send through fact sheets. Perhaps we could just let Vicky know at checkup and she can share both my contact details and flag um, anybody who would like some fact sheets or copies of the slide and we can send those through. But in the meantime, does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Tammy. It's David here. Um, there aren't any questions typed in there, but as you say, there's, there's so much information. It's so valuable to have a presentation from you that provides that summary of all the programs, the initiatives, the, the grants, the subsidies, etc. So just a really valuable uh, presentation there so that if anyone is looking for further information, they now know where to go. So you've saved us a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you. That. And people are saying, yes, they would love the fact sheets and, and further information. So thanks again, Tammy. Great. And uh, you'll be in touch with Vicky, who's our industry skills advisor. And yeah. Um, We'll um, pass any information on. Fantastic, okay. thank you. Thank you. And our next presentation is from Haleen Grogan. Haleen is the Chief Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Officer and Deputy Director General in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Division of Queensland Health. Haleen's always busy, but I guess she's got a particularly busy day today, being, clo being closed at the Gap Day. And I know Haleen did move some appointments around to be able to present uh, to us today. So a big thank you, Haleen. Um, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, well, we're trying to get the video working. We've got a lovely um, image there. <laughs> but, um, background off, I think. That's okay. We'll get... Um, so Kat's going to share your presentation. Presentation, anyway. Yeah. So Kat, could you please share? And then um, Haleen, if we can't see you, we can we can hear you though. Hear it. Yeah, that's good. So All right, I might. You. Can I just start? Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, we got it. Beautiful. <laughs> um, oh, we've got the leave the blurred background, so I'm not mucking around too much. Um, Hi, and thanks um, everyone for offering this, um, the privilege and opportunity to speak with you today. And 
Um, I will start as, as I always started by acknowledging the traditional and cultural custodians of the lands in which I am today and where each and every one of you might be and pay my respects to elders past and present. I always take the opportunity to thank my elders for the privileges I get to work on each and every day and certainly wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them um, in this position. Um, I might, I've got a um, presentation. Can I just check whether we have sent you our um, concept paper or not? Because I'm not sure where we're at in the process of um, drafting that. Uh, we, we've we got a copy, um, Haleen, so with oh, your good. Permission, we can send it to all the delegates. Good, okay, before I launch into the presentation, I'll just make one more comment and that's just the context of why we're here, which I'm sure most of you know, but I'll, I'll reaffirm some of the messaging. Um, we're on an, we've got the um, fortunate opportunity and privilege to be working in a um, health equity reform agenda with this government. Um, they've made major legislative changes with the Hospital and Health Act, so Hospital and Health Board Act to ensure that um, we have a voice on every HHS board by having um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait membership. And we also have um, in that amended legislation, the requirement for every HHS to um, develop co-develop, co-design and co-implement our First Nations health equity strategies with our communities, in particular the community control health sector. I am co-leading this um, agenda with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control sector through the leadership of Quake. And um, I just might give my, um, I think Cleveland was asked to join me and he is where I was this morning. So both of us are some, sometimes split and up where, where, we, where we go because we're often called upon together, which is a good thing. We like to um, uh, co-lead and co-present where we can. Um, in that health, health um, equity legislation amendments that were made, importantly, the subordinate legislation, which is regulation, requires um, the HHS is to eliminate racism, provide culturally capable care, to um, make sure that they connect with the social determinants, to achieve um, health, improved health outcomes, it's all in the law, and importantly, to have First Nations workforce um, um, proportionate to the First Nations people that they serve across every category and every um, level. So it's a, it's a big journey and it's certainly um, um, one that we're about to embark on and we've got less than 10 years now to do it. Um, so I'll start then with the presentations, otherwise I can keep rambling quite easily. <laughs> That's okay. You just tell us next and we'll, we'll proceed. Okay, I'll, I'll use next, okay. okay. Um, look, we're not going to um, achieve health equity, eliminate racism, or even you know, get any, we're close to closing the gap unless we value our First Nations workforce, unless we invest in our First Nations workforce, and unless we grow our First Nations workforce. And this government, as I, as I um, previous said, uh, previously said, um, mentioned has also got a government election commitment um, to support the legislative changes that they made. So the election commitment is for us to uh, progress and develop and we're co-developing co co that with Quake. Um, uh, Queensland, First Nations Health Workforce Strategy for Queensland. It's a new strategy. It won't place any existing and or national policy um, frameworks, but address workforce supply and demand pressures um, and try and, and that have probably not delivered us um, achieving our existing targets. And for all sorts of reasons that we've already got lots of um, strategies in place, what we're, what we're developing is a whole package, um, we're calling it a strategy of for, strategy for action. So it's focusing on a complete suite of actions. Next, thanks. Um, valuing our workforces. Uh, I don't know whether how many of you are familiar with Dr. Carmen Pardo's um, research. Uh, she did a PhD titled, Why Aren't Our Health Policies and Models of Care Improving Health Outcomes for First Nations People? And one of the um, outcomes of that research was the need to embed cultural ways of being, knowing and doing in our, into our models of care. And um, identified the, the importance of cultural safety, clinical safety um, alongside patient safety. And this is one of the things that um, we are still challenge, um, find challenging in the health system is to um, put cultural safety alongside patient safety and clinical safety and um, recognising the unique skills of our people for all sorts of reasons, including their cultural expertise and community focus. Um, valuing our workforces in the health system will bring us um, cultural capability, will bring us incorporation of cultural perspectives and many other things. And it's not just in having the people in the system, but it's a way that we work as an organisation and, and, and the importance of having First Nations workforce. Uh, next. 
investing and growing in our workforces. And, you know, I think many of you who, who know me and heard me speak before, I always talk about having our people in the system from gardeners to surgeons across every geographical location, occupational stream, you know, areas of work within the health system, both clinical and non-clinical, um, playing, you know, cultural brokerage roles from the front line right to the system leadership position like I have the opportunity to be in. The health sector is one of the largest employers in Queensland and probably in every jurisdiction. So, you know, we offer substantial opportunities. Um, the, as many of you know, another government election commitment was the allocation of, um, you know, almost 100,000 positions in Queensland Health. Uh, for us, if we were to cut this by 3% or 4.7 positions, we've identified the numbers that would do to get uh, an equitable target across all those positions. The health sector, like um, police and education, but probably more so health, is one of the largest employers in the rural remote areas. So one of the um, practical outcomes of even being um, getting our mob in the system is um, improving one of the social determinants of employment um, as, a, as a positive um, consequence of having our mob in the system. Uh, next. The challenges that we have is that we've got, you know, we've had First Nations workforce targets and actions in existing policies and strategies, both at state and national levels for, for some time. And um, we haven't met or delivered those targets and we need to change this. Our current workforce target in our strategy um, is 3% by December, 2022. Um, it was set in 2016. And currently in, we have a work, a First Nations workforce at 2.4%. Um, so we're not on track to meet the 3% target by December. Uh, it's probably too low because our, our population in Queensland is 4.7%. So in fact, unfortunately, we've gone backwards. Um, and in fact, when we looked across the years since the um, um, target was set and before the target was set, because actually uh, way back in 97, we started some of this work when I did the first ever Queensland Health um, uh, First Nations uh, health workforce strategy, uh, we've gone backwards. And in fact, in the highest ever representation we've had was back in 2005 at 2.53%. So we've never even reached 3%. So, I, you know, I can't stress this one enough in terms of the biggest challenge that we've got to achieve, and that is growing and investing in our workforce supply, um, making sure we've got the um, pipeline available. And not only have we got to target the, the young um, people coming through school, we've also got a pool of untapped qualified workers, you know, that we, we probably could and should get into the system. Uh, next. Uh, this uh, just shows you graphically um, what we were just talking about in terms of the targets and how poorly we've gone. And even with some, the impact of, you know, changes of government have certainly happened, but even when we've had um, good policy levers, we haven't been able to achieve the targets. And that's a pretty telling story, that, that graph there. Uh, next. So what are the opportunities? Um, you know, I already mentioned the recent changes in, in our legislation for every HHS um, definitely brings a, a, a massive opportunity. The, uh, each of the HHS's health equity strategies are being co-designed and we hope they've got till April this year to, to um, develop and publish them. I'm currently negotiating with uh, the minister to give every HHS um, the opportunity to get the co-design um, process right because it's been quite challenging to get it right currently not just using COVID as an as a excuse but certainly the impact of resources that had to prioritise you know managing the COVID response alongside the, the restrictions we've had about you know being able to engage properly has definitely impacted on HHS as being able to do this properly so um, we're hoping that they will be released um, this well they will be released this year because that's that's the that's what we are, what the commitment is to and um, the new First Nations Workforce Strategy for Action, uh, the concept paper which you have, um, is, is, will also be released later this year. Uh, we're going through the co-design process of Quake and, and about to get hopefully sign off from the sector um, soon. And we're hoping the focus of that strategy package of actions is um, on, the, on the supply and making sure that we can, we can grow our, um, particularly our local health workforces. Um, in 2021 budget, we've got a small amount of funding over two years just earmarked for that health equity work. Uh, it's it's non-recurrent. Uh, we do have to um, uh, hopefully influence the current the budget for next year and future budgets to invest 
in what's probably been an underinvestment in our First Nations um, workforce. And um, I'm very optimistic about the opportunity we have with this new piece of work. Uh, next. Uh, next steps. Um, so as I mentioned, we're co-designing the workforce strategy for actions with Quake. Um, and the, about to, we've gone to their board and we I just picked up a spelling error. How terrible is that? <laughs> we've gone to the, we've talked to the board and, to the, and we're about to talk to all the member organisations. Um, we've talked to the clinical chiefs and the HHSs about um, how we will collaborate on this new, on this new strategy. Um, subcommittee established to guide. Oh, I think we are considering about how we might set up a subcommittee. We have a tier two, I don't know whether some of you will know, but in Queensland Health, we've got a governance structure where we have tier one, which is the executive and the leadership board, Queensland Health Leadership Advisory Board. And then there's a suite of tier two um, committees that lead a, you know, uh, many reform agendas across, across the system. And there's a First Nations Health Improvement Advisory Committee. And I think we're currently cons considering establishing a tier three. Mostly the tier threes are time limited to, to progress pieces of work. And um, certainly we'll be involved in checkup in the PHNs in that subcommittee if it's established and like, likely to be established. Um, I think actually we were supposed to, we've had, sorry, we've had one meeting. We've had one meeting and I think um, a second meeting's coming. So I think we're sorting out that committee is what I should say, rather than um, saying we're establishing it. Uh, we're hoping the concept paper will release in May, um, pending you know us getting it uh, uh, agreed to with, with the community control sector in particular, and also the clinical chiefs. We really, while it's a suite of proposed actions, and certainly I haven't briefed the DG or the minister, we're hoping what those actions do is um, stimulate lots and lots of discussion. Um, and uh, engagement about what we think we need to do. Uh, we do want to hear from you about what you think will work and not work. And um, we particularly, um, you know, how do we actually truly uh, value our First Nations workforce, invest in them properly and adequately, and, um, you know, put, put proper effort in terms of growing our First Nation workforce. Um, three of three um, big, Big aspirations, but three things that, you know, the fundamental basis of, of what we're trying to do with the concept paper and the suite of actions that we've got there. And my apologies for not getting the subcommittee right. I've completely forgotten that we've actually got it established and we actually had our first meeting. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think there's a slide after that. I think that's it, is there? Oh, I forgot more. Oh, good. Some messages about what health providers can do now. And basically our messages here about, you know, obviously when any strategy um, is in development. We don't want people to wait to do things. We want support to happen for the current um, First Nations workforce, both clinical and non-clinical roles, where you can um, increase the number of Aboriginal people in all professions. We're, we're advocating for that, where investment can be directed to um, bring in Aboriginal people into the um, workforce through traineeships, cadetships, scholarships, and all and other incentivised pathways that are a part of the supply um, um, end of our strategies, you know, um, we're wanting health service providers to ensure models of care embed cultural safety into their design. And a simple way to do that is actually having First Nations people um, in, in those models of care and, you know, dedicating a uh, proportion of money on, on First Nations employment, procurement and training skills, um, make this business as usual. So, so some of these messages we're going to start prosecuting repeatedly um, in terms of what's possible and what we can do right now rather than waiting. And next. Ah, that's the last one. Well, that went, uh, did we get an opportunity to speak to anyone? Any questions? We have, uh, people can type questions, Haleen. Oh, um, yep. I'm just checking. Yep. We don't have anything in there at the moment. Yeah. So, um, but as you said, uh, we're very happy to forward on any materials you'd yes. like to do to this group um, during the consultation phase. Vicky, being our industry skills advisor, you know, is a oh, conduit good. there. So yep. please do let us know. Uh, yes. You say that we're checkups already involved in some of the, the committees, etc. Um, and obviously working close yeah. to Quake as well. So um, so no questions there. So can we share that your presentation? Is that fine? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so that'd be um, great. thank you again for taking the time. Um, <laughs> it's been a very busy day for you. Yeah, so yeah. It's my passion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, always great to, to hear from you. All right. If you need to go, thank we'll catch you thank later. Thank you.
Thanks. See ya. Bye bye. Bye. And our, our final presentation today is um, a bit of a collaborative effort. Um, it's a checkup and Queensland Health presentation. And we're going to talk about our own um, workforce programs. Um, so it's myself. Uh, we have, I've just mentioned Vicky's name. Vicky Meyer is our industry skills advisor. So she'll be just, for those of you who don't know about her role, it's an opportunity to hear about that. Um, we've also got Sabrina Kerr, who uh, is one of our program managers for our Gateway to Industry Schools program. Um, we'll give you an update on that. I'll talk a little bit about our Choose Your Own Health Career website, which you, hopefully you've already seen, but if you haven't, uh, I'll introduce that. And we actually have um, Amanda Hammer, who's a director at Workforce Strategy Branch, Queensland Health. Hi, Amanda, thanks for joining us. Um, we've worked really closely with Workforce Strategy Branch over the years, and that's in fact how Checkup's workforce journey began um, with, a, with some funding from Queensland Health Strategy Branch in 2019. So I'm going to kick off um, of the four people. I'll just start and then I'll hand over. So um, there's just some photos about some of the work that we've been undertaking over the last 12 months uh, through our workforce programs. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and that's, they're really our programs or our initiatives. There's the Gateway, the Industry Skills Advisor, two websites, Choose Your Own and Grow Your Own. And the new project that Amanda's going to speak to today, we've been funded, um, we'll explain what HEAP phase four means um, in a moment. But if we go to the next slide, um, that was our programs and I guess our funding in 2021. If you would have looked at that slide in a 2018 slide would have been blank. A 2019 slide would have had just a very short arrow where we um, undertook the Choose Your Own Health Career website. And then as you can see, we've had new programs come on board um, over the last um, years. And it's, and it's a growing area of work for checkup. And if we, so you can see there the two Desbit funded programs that um, Gateway and then uh, coming on this year is the Health Education to Employment um, Pathways Program Phase 4. And Checkup's been involved in the two previous phases, two and three. And so, as you can see, um, more programs, more funding, and Gateway's actually been funded right through to 2025. So, um, really great news there. So, that's what we wanted to just give you a little bit of an overview of today. And Sabrina's going to kick off now with a gateway update. Thanks, Ab. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, as David mentioned, I'm, my name's Sabrina. I am part of the uh, Gateway Program uh, project program manager um, workforce, I guess. So, I just wanted to give you a bit of background on the Gateway Program to start off with. It was it was funded back in 2020 by the Department of Employment, Small Business and Training. There are currently 10 industries of focus across the Gateway to Industry Schools program and health is actually one of the newer industries which was funded back in 2020. So there were four new industries funded and uh, Checkup was successful in receiving that funding to coordinate the program across Queensland, specifically uh, within health. So just an overall aim of the program, it really is to raise awareness and understanding of the range of job opportunities within the health sector, um, specifically for students, and um, also to support building effective partnerships between schools and also industry um, to ensure young people have access to student experiential learning opportunities such as work placements, experience, work trialling, um, and just getting an understanding of what it's like to actually work within the health sector. So I also did want to mention uh, that the Gateway Program is guided by an industry reference group where we have representation from across schools networks, government organisations, DESBIT of course, training organisations and of course industry and um, we, that, was, that was established at the outset of the program. So next slide please. This is just a really quick snapshot of um, the, I guess, the key outcomes of the program from 2021. So it just gives you an idea of how much activity is actually involved in the Gateway program. So we engaged with around 58 different health industry partners. Uh, we 
onboarded 32 gateway schools across Queensland with a nice spread across uh, HHS regions. There were 162 occasions of engagement with external stakeholders. We engaged with 4,902 students across 20 or 21 career events. Uh, that's just specifically gateway schools as well. At the Health Gateway Forum, which was undertaken in October of last year, we had 118 delegates attend, and that was across from that was from within the schools network as well as industry as well. Uh, we funded 27 different experiential activities uh, that targeted over two or almost 3,000 students and 150 teachers. And finally, 3,840 page views uh, of our new Gateway to Health website, which was developed and launched. Um, was that last year? I think, yeah. I think early last year or 2020, yeah. So that just, again, gives you an understanding of how much activity is actually involved in the program. And this is only going to increase as the program continues to build. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so speaking of building the program, I guess, uh, one of the things we have done is built on our existing workforce of the Gateway Program. We have actually, um, we've taken a recently, uh, who's come on board, are four new uh, outreach coordinators to support the implementation of the program within regional areas. Um, David mentioned the outreach program previously. You might be aware that uh, we have regional coordinators within uh, regional areas of Queensland that, that facilitate and support the outreach program. And they have a strong existing relationships with the outreach service provider network, as well as other industry within the local areas. So it makes a perfect fit for them to support the program within those regional areas. Um, as you can see, you've got myself, I cover Brisbane South Gold Coast, Kat Murray, who covers Brisbane North and Sunshine Coast, Cassie French, who covers Wide Bay, Central Queensland, Central West Queensland, Lynn Anderson, Townsville, Mackay in Northwest, Melanie Sheridan uh, covers Cairns and Far North Queensland, and finally, Rachel Smith covers Southwestern Toowoomba. So we're very excited to have Cassie, Lynn, Melanie, and Rachel join the team for this year. And this just gives you a graphical representation of, I guess, the uh, regional breakdown by HHS region. So you can see we've got good coverage across Queensland and we're aiming to engage schools from within every HHS region, region within Queensland. So um, just wanted to provide an overview of the program uh, and how it's sort of, I guess, implemented across Queensland. So it incorporates five key focus areas. We call this the five Ps. Uh, partnerships, which is all about facilitating partnerships between health gateway schools and also industry to promote opportunities for students. Pathways is about identifying and promoting a range of career opportunities for students um, and staff of gateway schools. Participation focuses on supporting student experiential learning opportunities such as work placements, uh, work trialling, you know, work experience and so forth. Professional development aims to build capacity of, and understanding of the school teachers and staff. Promotion, obviously promoting the program, providing regular communication and also key outcomes of the project as well. And um, did I miss any? No, I didn't. Uh, and obviously we have a comprehensive work plan as well, which we submit uh, annually to Desbit. So that just provides a bit of an overview of, I guess, what the program involves and the delivery of the program. So one of the things that we uh, are very excited to launch this year is the Healthcare is Everywhere virtual resource. So this was developed last year. We've actually been working behind the scenes for quite some time. Um, funding was used from the Gateway Program to actually develop this virtual resource for students and also teachers and staff of schools. So as you know, over the last couple of years, we've had uh, lots of challenges presented with um, particularly around students accessing student experiential learning opportunities. So one of the things uh, that we decided to develop um, are a range of resources, online and virtual resources, to try and overcome some of those challenges uh, relating to COVID. Uh, so we developed Healthcare is Everywhere with um, a graphic designer or animator, 
And uh, this is basically going to sit on an online platform on our website. So it's called the Healthcare is Everywhere resource. So it basically provides uh, a graphical representation of a hypothetical metropolitan city and also a hypothetical rural, I guess, setting uh, where users can kind of zoom in, scroll around, have a look around. There's a whole range of different buildings and settings within there that represent different health services and providers. So um, you can see on this slide, this particular one is the metropolitan view. And if you go to the next slide, Kat, that's an example of a rural um, setting. So obviously quite different uh, in the way health services are delivered. Uh, it's not gonna be the same as a rural setting. So we need to ensure that that's represented um, effectively. So if you go to the next slide, so users can basically, as I said, zoom in, have a look around, they can click on particular buildings. We'll use general practice as an example. And if they click on a building, um, next slide, Kat, it opens up a whole series of, again, hypothetical rooms within um, that setting. And, you know, for example, administration, clinic rooms, consult rooms, and then within each of those rooms, so next slide, please, Kat. <laughs> Um, it pulls up a whole lot of different information about the actual uh, setting itself, an overview of what might be involved if you work in that setting, and also um, the whole range of different uh, career options and job opportunities within that setting. So it focuses on both clinical and non-clinical roles. So for example, some of non-clinical roles might include health administration, finance roles, even uh, maintenance roles, and trade roles, for example, that work in health settings, all the way through to clinical roles, such as allied health, nurse, nursing and pathology. So each, um, each of the information sections also have links to further information and resources. And where possible, we do link to our Choose Your Own Health Career website, which David's gonna talk a bit more about shortly. So next slide, and that's just an example. The next couple of slides take you through an example of what it might look like in a rural setting. So as you can see, uh, quite different. So we haven't actually formally launched this, but we are looking at formally launching it within the next few weeks. Uh, we will provide some communication quite widely, quite broadly. So keep an eye out. We encourage you to have a, have a look around, explore the resource and also share amongst your networks as well when you have the opportunity. But um, yeah, that's it from me. I was gonna hand over to David to talk about CYO. Thanks, Sab. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly, a, a key resource for the Gateway Schools program is our Choose Your Own Health Career website. And as I said, that was developed in 2019 in collaboration with, um, many people um, from different uh, sectors. So education, training, um, health providers, etc. So just going to fly through that. I just encourage you, if you haven't already seen it, uh, it is our key resource. So um, Kat, if you can just flick through the next quite quickly. So we have career pathways. Uh, that's the key part of the site. Job profiles. So more information about the different roles in health. This is one of the best parts of the site, I think, the personal stories. So we've got 30 young people there that are now working in healthcare and they tell their story. And as you can see, um, it is growing. So we, and we want that to you know, skyrocket again this year. So um, please do visit that site. And if you know young people um, who are thinking about a career in health, please um, forward that on to them. So just quickly there about CYO. Um, I mentioned this new program earlier and it's a collaboration. It's uh, with Queensland Health Workforce Strategy Branch. They have provided funding um, to check up to roll this out. And it's just commenced over the last few weeks and, and we're lucky to have Amanda Hammer here join us today to um, who, whose concept it was. And um, she'll just tell us a little bit about it. Thanks, Amanda. Just unmute myself. Morning, everybody. Um, it's been an amazing uh, webinar and I think I'm glad it's being recorded so I can go back and, and go over everybody's presentations as well. So I just really wanted to speak very briefly to um, what we've referred to as phase four of the Health Education to Employment Pathways initiative that um, commenced in um, through the Department of Health uh, a, number, a 
short number of years ago, with phase one being the development of the um, Grow Your Own health workforce um, online information and tools, which is now currently hosted by, by checkups. Um, so it's great to have all the resources in the one place and linked up to all the other major initiatives that are occurring in this space. Um, we uh, subsequently through that work, because Grow Your Own was targeting um, health service providers, health industry, about how they can develop local initiatives to grow their own workforces. But it was identified through that work that there was um, a strong need to also be targeting young people, families, others who may wish to be thinking about a health career to help them navigate pathways in. So that's where we were really excited to partner with, with Checkup in the development of that resource which um, went subsequently went through two additional phases. So I think where um, we're at, um, we really thought it was timely to step back and have a look at developing a systems perspective, um, which would assist Queensland Health, not only as a major employer, but also um, as a, government portfolio lead for health and health services is to really look at how the department can better influence investment and funding models in uh, VET and also the quality, accessibility and relevance of VET training um, in Queensland and particularly looking at how health careers are promoted. So, um, Again, we turned to Checkup as the ideal partner, particularly with, um, and I talked the other day about the maturity of the health industry schools advisory role, the establishment of the Gateway Schools program, and the ongoing amazing developments of the, the Grow Your Own um, website with, uh, we thought it was, um, you know, uh, most appropriate to again engage checkup in this work. And I think particularly at this time now where there are significant national reforms, some of which we've heard this morning that are, um, that are progressing through the VET sector. So we really have to navigate a new way forward. So what we've done is we've um, engaged with checkup to undertake a research piece um, for us and develop a research report that will identify opportunities and challenges for the department to influence VET at a system level and provide recommendations and actions um, that uh, health, Queensland Health may be able to um, undertake, as I said, in those areas about influencing um, investment and funding, quality, accessibility and relevance. So I won't spend too much time talking about that, but the um, really pleased checkups off and running already establishing a project reference group and uh, will be undertaking that work over the next couple of months. The second piece we've engaged with checkup again um, around is really take that um, choose your own, grow your own workforce concept to the next level. We appreciate that there's significant investment in this space through the Department of Employment, Small Business and Training, through the Commonwealth and um, seed funding that's previously and currently being depart provided through the department, for example. But it was, um, we're really interested in exploring how these models and, and the um, investment from all different uh, pipelines, how can we optimise um, this at a local level? And is there the opportunity to really look and test within identified communities, how we can, um, with a, a modest amount of additional funding, um, optimise outcomes within those communities? So we've engaged with um, Checkup to um, work through um, 
the design implementation and impact of um, an integrated place-based grow your own health workforce initiative um, to help us better understand how, um, how those models can um, be improved and supported. Um, and through, through that work also be brokering partnerships and engagement with organisations at a local level um, to facilitate that work. So ultimately the outcomes that we're expecting are that our department is better able to lead and actively influence uh, health vet skills, including micro-credentialing and training needs, um, how we can uh, inform and prioritise strategies to improve the coordination of funding arrangements and just really support the available evidence in regards to the effectiveness, scalability and sustainability of Grow Your Own Workforce Initiatives. So I'll leave it there, um, but it was really just give you a flavour of what we've got ahead of us. And I'm sure you'll be hearing much more about it as we go. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, and finally, um, <clears throat> I mentioned before uh, another program um, checkup operates is the Health Industry Skills Advisor uh, role, which is um, filled by Vicky Meyer. So over to you, Vicky, to give you to give us a short overview of your program. Thank you, David. And it will be a short, short overview, <laughs> one minute. Um, if you could just go to the next slide. So just for people that don't know what the role of the Health Industry Skills Advisor is, it's a role that uh, funded by Department of Employment, Small Business and Training. Um, and its purpose is to engage with employers, small business and industry stakeholders to provide that evidence um, and advice to the department of where the investment in skills and training for the health industry needs to be and where it should be targeted. So a lot of the advice that we seek from industry, a lot of the research that we do in this role is looking at where the current and emergency, emerging industry needs are, and that's across the state. We take a regional approach to that and I take a subsector approach to that because not every, um, there's no one size fits all in Queensland. Um, we're also looking at where that jobs growth and those employment opportunities are for the health industry. Uh, we started this role in 2020 and we're funded through till June 2023. And if you could just go to the next slide. So what the advice influences and a deeper component of this is to really engage with industry. This, can't, this isn't a job that's um, sitting behind your desk. We go out and we engage with people and we are held to a client by the department in our reporting that we have to provide evidence that any solution that we put forward, any issue that we raise, it has been um, driven by our industry engagement. What that means is that we then inform and align the training and skills priority and the decision making by Desbit, and that includes the program design, the investment settings. So there is a priority skills list where there is um, qualifications which are subsidised by the Department of Employment, Small Business and Training. We regularly seek feedback from industry on where the pathways leading to employment opportunities, what are those priority pathways to make sure that that list is actually working for industry. We also have a role in supporting um, the vet quality and making sure that the, the training that is being delivered throughout the state is meeting industry needs and is fit for purpose. And we also inform and contribute to national vocation, education and training reform agendas and um, training packages to make sure again that they're fit for purpose, but also that they are suitable for the Queensland landscape. And again, it's a broad range. We don't just in, um, consult with in the industry, we consult with education, we consult with education providers. And really we're trying to, we build a gap between industry and government. So this role becomes a bit of a conduit and it becomes a voice for industry in this space. If you just wanna to go to the next slide. One of the um, pieces of work that we did last year and I'd encourage people to, to have a look at this, it's available online, but we will forward the link to people, is that we've started to profile what the health industry looks like in Queensland. 
um, in terms of the supply and demand in the vocational education and training sector. Um, it's a report that's designed for use by industry to assist with accessing some of those programs that you heard um, Desbert and Desi talk about today. It builds that evidence base um, for industry. We've also then, through, as a resource of what we've been hearing from industry, where we think the top priority should be in terms of vocational education and training investment, and um, committing ourselves to what the priorities of the industry skills advisor is over the next 12 months. So if you have a look at that um, report, you'll see that we reference all of the engagement that we have done with industry. And this is, um, this is a, a resource for industry to use, but also to start that conversation with the education and training of providers and any other stakeholders that really have a role in this workforce and skills and training space. And unless there's any, oh, and just um, for people to know, and there was um, a workforce summit held on the 11th of March that was um, coordinated by Di Farmer, who is the Minister for Skills and Training. It was an invitation only event. Um, there was over 400 people invited to that um, across a range of industries. And it was really to target those industry leaders and to um, get their feedback on on the skills and training and employment priorities and needs in Queensland. Um, Checkup was lucky to be involved in that. We had um, our CEO and Marie Liddy attended. I attended as the industry skills advisor for health. We also were invited to have a uh, stand for the Gateway to Industry School project there. A lot of the recurring themes were there is a need for very run workforce approaches, for place-based workforce planning, and that we are um, targeting young people into those employment pathways. So we are still waiting to see the, um, the feedback from that summit, the write-up from it, the review, but we'll certainly keep people posted when we see opportunities for the health industry. Thanks, Vicky. And obviously um, we'll send Vicky's details along with lots of other materials that we'll be sending you today. We've heard a, a lot of information um, at various levels, at the state, federal level, uh, and a lot of on the ground, <coughs> excuse me, programs that we're running as well. So, so lots of info and we'll make sure we um, get that to you. Now, just before we wrap up, um, I did mention at the start that HESTA have been sponsoring these meetings and uh, Nanita is unwell today, but uh, at short notice, one of her colleagues, Ian Collier, I believe. Ian, are you there? We can, is that the microphone uh, working? There we yep, go. that's great. So if you want to take a couple of moments just to talk about um, HESTA and um, thanks once again for your sponsorship. Oh, no, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, we love um, supporting the industry in any way that we can. Um, many of you will be aware that HESTA is the, um, it's the super fund for the health sector. So we have over 900,000 members and nearly all of them are in the health sector. Um, we have something like 230,000 in community and disability services alone. Um, so we, we, we very much, um, whenever there's uh, issues or challenges in the industry, we, we very much feel that too. Uh, and we want to be part of the um, part of the solution and help where we can. Um, I didn't get to listen to all of the presentations uh, today, but, um, but just wanted to, to mention that some of the work we're doing with um, the, um, the Workforce Insights, if people haven't had a chance to read uh, the latest report that we um, we commissioned late last year. Um, we've got an internal media team that do a fantastic job um, of putting all that together. And, and effectively what we did is we we um, surveyed um, thousands and thousands of HESTA members and we just asked them about their, their workforce. Um, and then since then we've collated the data. This, this was undertaken pre-COVID and also during COVID. And some of the responses were, um, were very, very interesting. Um, we then segmented it further into different sectors. So we've, uh, the more recent report is for community and disability services. Um, so there's some really good insult, uh, insights in there around um, you know, what are the top reasons why people are leaving, uh, what are the, uh, either uh, their employer, why they're leaving the industry, and, and also some of the top reasons as to why they want to stay. Uh, and so there's some fairly clear themes um, in there. Um, interestingly, it's not always about the remuneration. Uh, whereas I think as an industry, we'd like to see that uh, move higher and people get um, paid for the work they do. But there was a lot of non, um, 
uh, monetary benefits that can um, can make a difference. So um, if anyone hasn't um, received that report, I'd be more than happy to send that out. Um, we've got electronic copies as well as hard copies. Um, there's some, yeah, there's some really, really good insights in there, and especially how about how people are valuing um, you know, their direct teams and colleagues that they work with. There's a, there's a really strong uh, sense of um, pride about what they do for the community, but also to a real strong sense of teamwork and, um, and, and the organisation they work for. So, but yeah, thank, thank you again for the opportunity to come along and say a few words today. And Anita was very disappointed she couldn't make it, but hopefully, hopefully I've stepped in in some small way.